Welcome back. Today, it's going to be fun. We've got loads of video games to chat about. There's some pretty big ones, like Warner Bros. dropping multiverses on us again, and then there is Hellblade 2 coming from Xbox, which does mark a return of first-party titles. And of course, as usual, we've got a host of pretty damn promising-looking indies. If you've been here before, you know the score. If you're new, basically, at the start of every month, we do a big video where we chronologically go through the month and pick out all the video games that basically look the most interesting that we think you should know about. It's a whole bunch of fun, so... That's what we're doing today. And of course, if you like this kind of video, you'll love our coverage over at Ballular.Games. That's where all of our content goes up as early as we can and ad-free. It's where we publish loading screen that lets us react to surprise hits, indie darlings, all that sort of stuff, which uh, will just hit your inbox every single day. It's a very good time. Thanks to everyone who supports us there. And let's get started with May. And launching into early access, Foundry has pretty much got all of the genre conventions that you would expect of an automation game, and that does mean it certainly piqued my interest. But it's happening on a map that is fully modifiable by players, so if you see a mountain full of resources, you can just remove it. And also, while they are recommending that you play with two to four players for the best experience, there is technically and literally in the game no upper limit bar the thing crashing for players. So that could equal some pretty crazy stuff. Now, I should say this game is being published by Paradox, and they've certainly proven themselves to be a label to be kind of wary of. The potentially good thing, though, is that Foundry might avoid this. Um, players on Itch have been helping the devs refine and build the game for two years, um, actually before Paradox got involved. So I suppose hopefully this is the game that kind of breaks the, I don't want to say the run of bad luck, but the run of bad decisions from Paradox. I would certainly be pleased if it does. For our next game then, what if Half-Life 1 was actually set in Australia and was a survival crafting game about descending into the depths of a research facility that has lost control of its specimens after a dimensional breach, just that you can also do it with your friends? I mean, to me, that does sound like a good prospect. The game is abiotic factor, and it's very much wearing its influences on its lab coat uh, rather proudly. I mean, just look at the graphics, right? The beautifully late 90s looking character models. So essentially, it's you and your five mates going and doing Half-Life 1 looking things. Personally, the setting has grabbed me. We're not used to a survival game where you're scavenging, say, tape and plastic from a cafeteria, right? Normally, you are punching trees. So for me, that's a great point of differentiation. It's drawing, obviously, from pretty damn amazing source material. I'm excited about this, and because it is an early access launch, that does mean approach it with caution if you do want to go in day one, but for the rest of us, it means there's a decent chance that in a year or two, we'll all be able to do some sort of polished Half-Life 1 survival crafting experience with our mates, which to me sounds awesome. Next, things are going crazy. I mean, adventure games come in all shapes and sizes, but I really do not remember the last time that I was asked to go on a journey of self-discovery as a nun traveling through a warped version of Russia with only the devil as my traveling companion and uh, conscious. So yes, it's an immediately grabbing concept. Now, saying that, the demo was rough in terms of performance and in terms of puzzle design. In terms of narrative, though, there really is nothing else that's trying to do this sort of thing. So, I mean, obviously, wait until reviews are there, but this is certainly one to be interested in. Then next, we've got a game seven years in development by a solo dev that's actually not Manor Lords. It was originally picked up as a showcase indie by PlayStation. It's a Metroidvania, and it's called Animal Well. It's actually also the first title from Donkey, yes, that one from YouTube, from uh, his publishing label, which is called Big Mode. Now, their whole promise was to uh, only publish good games, which uh, generally is the point that most publishers try to do. They, you know, usually uh, cock up in the middle somewhere. But honestly, it does look like it's off to a good start. We've got a pretty nice looking pixelated CR aesthetic that's quite well enhanced by just lovely lighting effects. I mean, it's a tried and true thing. You go very retro style, but go very modern in your lighting, and you just end up with something that's just deliciously visually rich. Overall, then, it looks like an interesting game. It's a new publisher coming into the biz, and uh, I mean, hey, just thinking about the vibes, right? Like, ethereal, spooky, looks quite immersive, full of secrets. I definitely think it's one to look out for. Next, then, PSX. We're going PSX-style survival horror with Crow Country. It is set in an abandoned theme park in the 90s, so number one, I'm totally down for that. And it's very much a game that loves classical, like, uh, Resident Evil conventions, right? Like, with your health meter, your inventory Tetris, your item-based puzzling, all that good stuff that I love. Um, of course, it is a fixed camera survival horror game, so it is that brand of Resident Evil rather than what they do in, the, like, the remake games. Overall, though, 
it is looking really cool. And it's got a neat feature called exploration mode, where basically if you really love the vibes and you love the puzzles, but you don't want to do the fighting, well, then um, they actually have a mode for that. So I suppose some sort of play to allow them to open up their audience, but maybe maybe because they know that that is there as a bit of a like a, a pressure valve maybe it's letting them go just a little bit more spicy in the combat who knows we'll have to see when it launches next then if stray just left you wanting like more cats in video games while well, you might be interested in little kitty big city which is obviously going to be compared to stray though it's definitely trying to be different there are lots of uh, just lots of mechanics essentially platforming, solving puzzles to reach new areas, interacting with the citizens of Big City to basically help or hinder them in order to get home. And really the best comparison here is more of a untitled goose game, right? Just kind of going hard in that sense of mischief that works for geese and absolutely works cats. Next up then, 1000X Resist. Honestly, it just looks really weird and goofy, so I'm kind of interested in that. I will say, disclosure-wise, um, they are published by the publisher that published our first game, Fellow Traveler, so uh, yeah, there's that. To be honest, though, it just looks a bit off the wall, a bit interesting. Um, it's a deeply personal game coming from the team's own experiences in the pandemic, and it just looks like it's trying to be interesting, right? Diving into dystopia stuff, but really trying to get at the heart of characters and uh, just like societies that are formed in extreme circumstances, which for me is something I've always found interesting in media, be it like a Battlestar Galactica or what Frostpunk is trying to do via game mechanics. I just think it's a fun space to play in. And speaking of Battlestar Galactica, one thing that had a lot of DNA put into its visual effects was Homeworld, and that's why I've got to talk about Homeworld 3. So it was originally planned to release in 2022. After it was announced in 2017, it suffered many different delays, but it does look like Homeworld 3 is finally coming out on the 13th. Original Relic staff have been attached to the sequel that is being done by Blackbird Interactive since the announcement, so that's good, right? Hopefully a sense of continuity between the games. Uh, for me, like 3D spatial combat with like realistic ballistics and that sort of thing, that looks awesome when you're throwing in like big, you know, mega structures, space stations. I mean, to me, it all just looks fantastic. Again, though, Blackbird have been a team that have certainly had challenges. They've been hit with layoffs. So that does have me just a little bit worried about the launch state. But again, good things happen to you when you don't pre-order. And I also do think about the Battlestar Galactica mods that exist for Homeworld 1 and 2. So, uh, yeah, if we can get a Battlestar Galactica mod over here, I would be a very happy camper indeed. One thing to remember is that the delay, at least the most recent one, it was a result of feedback and criticism from the Steam Next Fest demo. So hopefully that means that they've been able to be very targeted in making this a better experience for the launch. Again, we'll just have to wait and see. Next then, we've got Ubisoft doing interesting things. And I know that sounds like a bit of an oxymoron sometimes, but look, Prince of Persia, The Lost Crown was really quite fantastic. And this time around, Ubisoft are doing something a bit different with the Rogue Prince of Persia. So it is Prince of Persia, but it's less Metroidvania, far more roguelite. And they've partnered with the people uh, that uh, have made a pretty wonderful game called Dead Cells. So yeah, we're essentially getting roguelite, Prince of Persia, Dead Cells. Now it's uh, not the team that made Dead Cells, it's the team that's been like maintaining Dead Cells. I think most notably they were doing the Dead Cells Castlevania DLC. So honestly, I mean, come on, that, that just seems like it'll be great. Now also, this is going to be skipping both Uplay and thankfully skipping Epic Game Store exclusivity, because that's the one downside with Ubisoft. They've done so many Epic Game Store exclusives that as a PC gamer, you just don't, you don't notice them. So this uh, is actually going to be launching into early access on Steam, which is something that we know works very, very well for this genre, so definitely a good move. Next then, we've got another entry into the PlayStation game put onto the PC genre in the form of Ghost of Tsushima. I absolutely, uh, yes, cannot wait. So if you want your big Kurosawa vibes on your PC, well, it's going to be happening. And the good news is, it was ported by Nixies, and they have done really, really terrific work in the past. Uh, one potential note is this is the first uh, PC game from Sony that actually brings the PlayStation account system over to PC. So the good thing is that means crossplay, trophies, friend lists, and stuff. The trade-off is you'll have to log into it in order to access the multiplayer Legends mode. So a little bit unfortunate, but hey, if you've been watching Shogun and you want to gallivant about Japan doing uh, slashy things, well, this will hopefully scratch that itch. So certainly if you've been enjoying the TV show Shogun, which I have, uh, this will have you in the mood to uh, go do samurai things. Next, we've got a game from the people who made Sayonara Wild Hearts, which 
I mean, it was almost like a sort of playable album. It was a pretty neat game, actually. I enjoyed it on my iPad. Anyway, this game is called Lorelei and the Laser Eyes, and it is a third-person puzzle adventure game. Essentially, and going through the trailers, you can really see they're trying to go for like a slow burn mystery. The idea is there's 150 puzzles, but there is non-linearity to it. So not really trying to be a super stressful experience. However, they clearly want you to feel a constant sense of unease and absurdity as you're uncovering all of those secrets. So if they do their job right, could be quite a rewarding experience. But again, we will need to wait for reviews. Next up then, we've got Re-Rising. Now, this is a game you may have heard about before because it did come out in Early Access last year. That being said, it's now fully released. And since that initial Early Access period, there have been overhauls to combat, to lighting, and a whole suite of quality of life features that basically means even if you did try it out back then, it will be a more polished experience now. It's also coming out on consoles, and as a nice side benefit, that means that on PC, we're also getting some reworked controller support. Content-wise, there's actually three new difficulties coming with this launch and a new endgame for all players in the form of Dracula's Arrival. And they've also done a neat little collaboration with Konami, of course, with the Castlevania IP. Overall then, this is a game that was fantastic in its early access incarnation. It's only got stronger since then, so certainly hopes are pretty high for this launch. And next, if you watch loads of Seth videos like I do, then you may know that Heroes of Might and Magic is pretty awesome, but uh, it's not always been treated the best, and the last Heroes of Might and Magic game was in 2015. So the good news is we've got a new game that is called Songs of Conquest, a bit like Heroes of Might and Magic, which is not the sort of game that they tend to make these days. So you are doing kingdom management, RPG mechanics, tactical combat, essentially a big throwback to, I mean, the best of uh, Heroes of Might and Magic. It spent two years in early access, and that does mean that the 1.0 launch will basically be a capstone, right? Like of, of all of the progress that they have made thus far, close out the narrative. So overall, that looks awesome to me. I know that so many people absolutely love Heroes of Might and Magic to death, and spend hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of hours in Heroes of Might and Magic, so let's hope that they get something pretty awesome to play. Next then, one I am absolutely excited for, it is Senua Saga Hellblade 2. I mean, number one, the photo real visuals here are absolutely insane. This is an Unreal Engine 5 game that really does seem to be pushing what that engine can do. I mean, ugh, the trailers have been so good. And of course, Hellblade 1 was a much loved game. Yes, it did have some bugs at launch, but ultimately, it kind of was like a double A title. It really just showed that with a bit of a, you know, a smaller budget, but pretty smart development, you really can get a lot done and uh, just have a really big impact. So that's what Ninja Theory did. Obviously then Microsoft acquisition, all of that, they're owned by Xbox now. Uh, they've certainly though been spending quite a lot of time in this. It looks absolutely amazing. It's absolutely one that I'm excited for. Next then, credit where it's due. Nintendo have been doing a pretty damn good job with their remakes. And this time we've got Paper Mario, the thousand year door that in terms of presentation looks absolutely stunning. And uh, while it may only run at 30 FPS, it is a stylized tactical RPG, so I think we'll survive. And I mean, look, I'm, I'm a diehard 60 plus FPS person, but something like this, I mean, I can survive. So yeah, I mean, hey, it, it's an awesome game. The Nintendo remakes have broadly been really, really good. So a lot of people will love this one. Next up then, it is Starfleet time because Star Trek Resurgence is getting its functional release. I, I say that because it had been on the Epic Game Store, which of course means that uh, nobody really knows it existed. So that game is actually coming out onto Steam. It's made by a team that is comprised of former Telltale devs, and that pretty much tells you what this game is going to be about, right? You'll be doing political negotiations, many Star Trek things, you'll be doing your away missions and all of that, and ultimately, right, as a video game, this is not some sort of like 10 out of 10 going to set the world on fire. But from what I've seen, it's a really good, like, true Star Trek narrative, so people have enjoyed that. And as a game, it's really good. So it's probably not something to pick up if you're not a fan of Star Trek, but if you are a fan of Star Trek, especially like that era, it does seem that they've done a pretty good send up of all of that. Next then, we have a visual novel that is called Until Then that opens with the player repeatedly trying to wake up the protagonist by beeping an alarm with button presses. And uh, that kind of sets the tone for a game that is essentially trying to blend loads of different forms of storytelling. You have obviously dialogue, social media logs, some pretty clever looking gameplay, writing that does feel true to the setting as well. I look, I love it whenever 
you know, you're, you're kind of like doing a visual novel game, but you're really trying to like, uh, I suppose, innovate, do different things with it. So to me, this one just kind of stands out. Now, narratively, what you're doing is you're following the main character, Mark and his friends, as they're making their way through their last year in high school in a world that is reeling from loads of natural disasters and where there's some sort of mystery because parts of Mark's life and history, they just literally do not make any sense. So you're unraveling mysteries in a VN that itself is trying to do interesting things. If that's your sort of thing, I think it's probably something you'd really enjoy. It's also their first published title. So uh, number one, I wish them luck. It's always a stressful experience. And number two, it does look like they're trying to come out swinging, doing interesting things, which I respect. Next then, the type of game that we absolutely love is the short focused experience. The idea that in an evening or two, you can just sit down, have a bunch of story, have a bunch of whatever it is, and just feel really satisfied. And Duck Detective, the secret salami, is uh, basically part of that tradition. So think Return of the Oberdin, but instead imagine it's all cartoon 2D cutouts in a very colorful world that uh, basically has you playing a noir detective who just so happens to be a duck with a bread habit uh, that is so bad that your wife left you. I mean, absurd bollocks, lots of mysteries, uh, noir protagonist, and VO that is worthy of a good noir protagonist as well. Um, yeah, th this just looks cool. I really hope it's good. Next then, we have a strange game because it has came out before, but uh, I suppose if you want to game the system and make it into our launch roundup videos, uh, you could always just unlaunch your game and then launch it again, which is what has happened with multiverses. It's coming back, and essentially what happened is that player first games wanted to overhaul this with rollback net code, which is extremely important for a fighting game, better readability, new mechanics like dashes and parries for all characters, as well as some complete reworks to character kits. And this is also returning in its uh, like live service monetization form that should at least include premium currency on the battle pass. Again, we'll have to see whether that works, but the, the kind of core thing with multiverses is People loved it. It like it really exploded. It did really well, but they just weren't able to follow through. More of a success than they really were ready for, I guess. So they've done that and uh, also generated odd headlines about the characters just being a bit bigger now. Anyway, the next thing is a boomer shooter. Uh, let's hope this one is doing a little bit better than last month's boomer shooter call out. So this one is called Salico, uh, where you are a security officer. Don, who has got to defend an underground facility that houses the last vestiges of humanity from an outside invasion. And of course she is going to be doing that via big guns and lots of environmental damage, meaning that by the time you've finished a level, it, I, I mean, I suppose looks like a battlefield map at the end. Um, also, the enemy AI, they say, is inspired by the Fear series. The Fear games, by the way, really worth playing if you just want a few really just good evenings. An older game, but one that is just interesting. I mean, the gunplay of fear, it feels great. So there, there's a free recommendation. Anyhow, this does look fairly interesting. I love seeing the boomer shooter uh, kind of renaissance continue. And uh, this is another example of that. So that's it for today. This is a month where almost every niche has been explored, right? Whether you want songs of conquest, like games, you know, like Heroes of Might and Magic, survival titles like V Rising or the really big hits like Hellblade 2. Yeah, a lot of really cool stuff. So let me know. What are you excited for? Is there something that is not in today's list that you're excited for? And of course, if you want more updates and if any of these launches end up being particularly notable, do check out bellular.games if you get on the loading screen newsletter. Uh, well, we will bring the news to your inbox. Okay, that's it for now. There are plenty of other videos on this channel and uh, I'll be back again with another one tomorrow. So thanks for hanging out and I'll see you then.